let's chat about chapter five, the physical and chemical properties of metals. So the microstructure of a metal determines the kinds of properties it will have. The microstructure is the size and arrangement of the grains visible under a microscope. Metals with the same composition do not always have the same properties. The history of a metal must be accounted for. This includes the rate of cooling, so things like heat treatment or casting, and the deformation imparted by either hot or cold working. When metal is molten, there is no grain structure. The atoms move around in an amorphous structure, so kind of like water or glass. When the metal is at room temperature, there is a definite grain structure. It is visible under a microscope. So you get these crystalline structures with these endless long rows of atoms neatly arranged together. So what happens in between? We're going to talk about how these grains form. The metal cools from the molten state, the heat must escape. The heat will always take the path of least resistance. So heat always moves from hot to cold. This means that in a typical mold, the outside of the mold will cool first. So the inside of the metal casting will cool last. So as the outside is solidifying, the inside metal will still be slushy or even liquid until all the heat from there can escape to the outside. In cooling, solid crystals will form. Dendrites are crystals that start to form from the wall of the mold inward. They resemble a pine tree. They have little, looks like branches that are moving toward the center of the mold. This is the heat trying to find a way out. The dendrites will become the grains that form the microstructure of the metal when it is completely solidified. The size of the dendrite formation, the formations, depends on the rate of cooling. Essentially, slow cooling means larger dendrites, which means larger grains. The size of the grains has a measurable effect on the properties of the metal. So long story short, large grains typically means the metal is weaker but more ductile. Small grains means the metal is stronger but more brittle, so less ductile. Let's chat about hot working and cold working. So when a solid metal is deformed, for example, taking an ingot and turning it into a bar or a billet, the grains are put under stress. There's a limit to the amount of deformation a metal will stand until it fractures or breaks. This is expressed as a percent reduction or percent elongation, depending on what kind of stress you're putting on the metal. Besides the risk of fracture, when metal is deformed, the grains get smaller. This results in a stronger but more brittle product. A common technique to avoid this dilemma is known as hot work or hot rolling reduction. The metal is heated to around 2100 degrees before being squeezed through large rollers. At this temperature, the metal is solid, but a phenomena known as recrystallization occurs. Recrystallization is when the grains will reform themselves after being worked. So what happens is you have this red hot metal, it goes through the rolls, the grains are compressed, and then the recrystallization causes them to grow back to their normal size or near their normal size before you put them through the rollers. What this does is give you back that ductility that you had before. Dynamic recrystallization occurs slightly below the melting point of the metal. When the metal goes through the rolls, at this temperature, the grains reform almost as quickly as the deformation occurs, so nearly instantly. By carefully controlling the hot work temperature, the final grain size can be refined to a fine, uniform grain, much more ductile than a similar cold work operation. So a reason this is done when you have a casting, an ingot, 
you have different grains throughout the casting. Remember we talked about it a minute ago, in the center of the ingot, you'll have big grains because they took longer to cool, to get the heat out. Toward the outside of the casting or ingot, you'll have small grains that were near the mold sides. They got to cool down quickly. So you got that gradient of material properties throughout that casting. What hot work does is takes that you know, variable grain structure, you run it through the rolls, it recrystallizes, and now you have a uniform structure of grains. So controlling the temperature and the amount of reduction, you could get medium-sized grains throughout the entire piece of metal instead of having big grains in the middle, small grains on the outside. So this gives you uniform properties, which is almost always desirable in metal. So let's chat about the structures in steel. Steel is essentially a combination of iron and carbon. There's typically other things added in there, but carbon has the most to do with the final properties of steel. The iron exists in phases, similar to water, having liquid and solid and gas phases. Iron has its own group of phases, including those, but also some different ones that water doesn't have. So at room temperature, iron is in what's called the ferrite phase. This has the body-centered cubic structure. Above around 1300 degrees, the iron crystals change. Now at this point, the metal is red hot. It's still solid, but you've got a crystalline change happening inside of the metal. You can't really see it, but we can measure it and know it occurs. The change makes those body-centered cubic crystals into face-centered cubic crystals. They have different properties. One of the different properties is the amount of carbon they can soak up within their structure. So face-centered cubic structure, known as austenite, can soak up about 0.1% of the carbon in the mix. As the metal cools, the ferrite, the body-centered cubic structure, can only soak up about 0.022% of the carbon. So this excess carbon is, has to have somewhere to go. What ends up happening is that it forms something called cementite. So three parts iron, one part carbon, also known as iron carbide. This is very, very hard and brittle by itself. But in a typical medium carbon steel, it's mixed in with the ferrite, which is fairly weak and ductile, in layers. These layers are known as perlite. So when you look at it under a microscope, it looks like plowed fields from an airplane. You've got interlap and overlapping layers of ferrite and cementite. Now under a microscope, they're different colors. Under a microscope, the ferrite is white, while the cementite layers are black. So we can look at it under a microscope and measure how much of each we have and how they're arranged. If the steel contains more carbon, more cementite will be formed during cooling, resulting in a stronger but more brittle material, even more so if you heat treat the material, which we'll talk about in a later chapter. Essentially, you have to have a certain amount of carbon to make a steel heat treatable and we'll see why later on. Let's chat about cold work. Cold work's material generally has good dimensional accuracy and surface finish. So there's no mill scale on a cold worked piece of metal that you buy. This necessitates the removal of mill scale before the actual working begins. This is accomplished by pickling. Pickling is when you take a piece of steel with mill scale on it and dip it into a vat of very, very strong acid. This acid dissolves the iron oxide mill scale on the outside of the part and leaves nice clean metal underneath that can go through the rolls to give you that dimensional accuracy you need. If you ran the material through the rolls with the mill scale on, you would be from a few thousandths off to maybe a sixteenth of an inch off, depending on how thick the metal is. So typically, 
the thicker the metal is, the more mill scale you're gonna have on that metal. So we get rid of that mill scale. Now we've got a nice clean piece of metal that we can run through the rolls. It'll be dimensionally accurate. After pickling, the metal must have a light coat of oil put on it or it will rust extremely quickly. So whenever you get in the stock room a piece of cold rolled steel, you'll notice it's typically shiny and it's typically oily because of that coat of oil. If you take all that oil off, it'll start rusting very, very quickly. That iron oxide mill scale provides some protection for steel. So besides dimensional accuracy and a good surface finish, cold working also provides something called work hardening. So when metal is deformed at room temperature, recrystallization cannot occur. The grains will undergo permanent change that can be seen, seen with a microscope. So dislocations are areas where the crystal structure is imperfect. Some atoms are out of order. These dislocations can result in planes of atoms being pinned. Where rows of atoms meet in an obstruction, the force required to move the atoms increases. This force required to move can be seen on a macro level as an increase in strength in the material. But these dislocations also build up, so it requires more to move them past each other. But when they do break, they kind of shatter, right? This is where brittleness comes from. The cold working is always going to impart a stronger but more brittle material. And this is sometimes desirable. I mean, there are cold work steels or cold work to get more strength out of the same, you know, weight of steel. Annealing is a process that recrystallizes the metal in an oven. So by heating the metal, to a certain temperature and holding for a certain amount of time, the distressed grains that were distressed by cold working will reform. This results in a loss of strength, but an increase in ductility. So if you cold work a material almost to the limit, it's gonna have a lot of internal stresses. It'll be strong, but very, very brittle. You typically wanna take it back a little bit and you know, get some of that uh, ductility back, lose a little bit of strength, annealing helps. Annealing is also useful when you have to cold work a metal past its maximum point. Okay, so say you have a four inch piece of steel and you want to make it a one inch piece of steel, you're not going to be able to do that by cold work alone. You reach the fracture point, you know, very quickly. So what you do, squish it down to say three inches and then you put it in the oven, anneal it, reform the grains, and then you squish it again. And you just keep doing that until you get the size of metal you need. So with steel, you can basically always go back, right? There's always an out to get the right grain structure, whether it's hot rolling, cold rolling, annealing, there's usually a way to reform the grains and get specifically what kind of material properties you want. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. This video is part of a course in the Advanced Manufacturing Technology Program at Hudson Valley Community College. We have plenty of courses online, including this one. If you are interested in continuing your education, please go to hvcc.edu and see what might be available for you.